Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you are well. Today we're going to take a stroll into the lair of Wise Disciple, a ministry that's run by a dude called Nate. And specifically, we're going to listen to Nate as he attempts to shatter Russell's teapot, which is an analogy that was formulated by Bertrand Russell to illustrate that the burden of proof rests upon those who are making unfalsifiable claims. But don't worry, we'll be sure to pour ourselves a hard coffee from Russell's teapot as and when Nate mischaracterizes it. And yes, I know what I've done there, I've made a positive claim, and so now I have a burden to prove it. Or do I? Perhaps it's you that has the burden to disprove it. Let's find out. Over the last couple of weeks, I decided to carve out some time and talk about the burden of proof. What is it? And more importantly, in debates and regular conversations, do non-Christians or Christians shoulder the burden of proof? The first video caused some consternation among some in the atheist community, and so I answered some of their comments in last week's video. You know, I'm tempted to also provide commentary on Nate's first video and the answers he offered to those questions he mentioned, but I'll leave this up to you, the audience. If you want to see me respond to his other burden of proof claims, then please do let me know through the comments. If you do, I'll likely do so on Casually Debunked. Here, however, we're focusing on Russell's teapot. Walking down this path, so to speak, and seeing some of the responses, particularly by those who disagree with me, it just brought back uh, this distant memory of something that I was wrestling with maybe 10 years ago now, maybe more than that. It was called Russell's Teapot. Russell's Teapot is named after the famous atheist Bertrand Russell, who, by the way, Bertrand Russell was a massive intellectual for his time. I strongly admire Russell's contributions, uh, his writings in particular, he was a very smart man. But he came up with this challenge to Christianity that centered on a thought experiment. Imagine a teapot floating in outer space. What does this have to do with the burden of proof or Christianity at all? I'm going to talk about it in this video. So first of all, like pretty much all apologists, Snake comes across as pretty confident and knowledgeable. He's explained that he wrestled with Russell's teapot 10 years ago, implying that he's long since shelved it, which as we'll see in a moment is indeed the case and he says that he strongly admires Russell's contributions, which implies that he's read at least a decent amount of Russell's work. This all serves to paint Nate as an authoritative figure. However, from the very get-go, there's signs of him not actually understanding the purpose of Russell's teapot. He said that Russell came up with it to challenge Christianity. But he came up with this challenge to Christianity that's centered on a thought experiment. But as we'll see in just a moment, this simply isn't the case. Russell did not create his analogy to challenge Christianity or even any specific proposition. Rather, his analogy challenges, if we want to use that word, who has the burden of proof in a setting in which a proposition, and especially an unfalsifiable proposition, is asserted. It's about the rules of debate, not a specific proposition, and thus it only challenges the Christian if and only if the Christian makes claims and then insists that their interlocutor disprove their claims. To get the proper context, let's read the source material. Russell gave the analogy in an unpublished article commissioned by Illustrated Magazine in 1952, titled Is There a God? In the short article, he speaks of Abrahamic monotheism broadly, and especially Judaism, not Christianity, and after dealing tersely with some of the most prominent theistic arguments of his day, he sets the stage for his analogy. And crucially, he does so by first establishing a very rare type of theism, namely one which doesn't claim God to be omnipotent. Here's the setup. There is, it is true, a modernist form of theism, according to which God is not omnipotent but is doing his best, in spite of great difficulties. This view, although it is new among Christians, is not new in the history of thought. It is, in fact, to be found in Plato. I do not think this view can be proved to be false. I think that all that can be said is that there is no positive reason in its favour. And it's here, with this setup, that he gave his teapot analogy. He writes, Many orthodox people speak as though it were the business of sceptics to disprove received dogmas rather than of dogmatists to prove them. This is, of course, a mistake. If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a China teapot revolving around the Sun in an elliptical orbit, nobody would be able to disprove my assertion provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to then say that, since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. So that's the claim, it's a pretty simple one. If I were to assert something that can't be disproved, and then, instead of offering evidence and argumentation, I insisted that you disprove my assertion, then I'd be guilty of shifting the burden of proof. To give a quick example that theists and atheists alike will likely accept, 
Suppose that I said that reincarnation is true, that when we die we are born anew and inhabit a new vessel according to our moral virtue, and then when you ask me to prove this, far from offering arguments and evidence, I insist that you disprove it. Russell's point is that this would be fallaciously shifting the burden of proof. If I make a positive claim, I inherit a burden to prove it. But that is, I think, enough context on the table. It doesn't strictly matter, I should say, whether or not the claim is unfalsifiable. It's just that if it is unfalsifiable, then the shifting of the burden of proof becomes more obvious. But right now, let's jump in. As I've mentioned very often when discussing the existence of God with atheists, uh, agnostics, skeptics, even some Christians, the notions of the burden of proof and supporting evidence are raised. Sometimes atheists and skeptics will say that they don't shoulder the burden of proof because they're not the ones making claims. Yes, and sometimes that's definitely the case. Many atheists, perhaps most, don't claim that God doesn't exist or that Christianity, Islam, Hinduism and or Norse religion is false. These atheists don't carry a burden of proof because they're not issuing a positive claim. Other atheists, however, such as myself, will say that certain gods don't exist, or that specific religions are false, and this does come with a burden of proof, because it's a positive claim. Basically, the dialectic is going to dictate who has burdens to fulfil, and again, Russell's teapot addresses a very specific dialectic, one in which those who make positive claims insist that their interlocutors disprove their claims. Now this is important to talk about, as good evidence provides a foundation for a reasonable inference on this issue, as well as just talking about this idea uh, that those who make claims must support them with some kind of evidence. So for example, if God exists, then there should be some evidence to support claims of his existence. And as Christian casemakers continue to show, there are a number of evidences that support the existence of God. Well, many would disagree, including Russell, who in his article, no less, succinctly tackled what was in his time a few of those arguments, a few of those alleged pieces of evidence. Some theists, for instance, claim that life itself is evidence of God, whereas some atheists would claim that life as we know it, with all of its natural evil, is actually evidence against God, at least the Triomni God. But more to the point, and to reiterate, Russell issued his teapot analogy in specifically the context of the theist insisting that the atheist disprove God's existence. If, instead, the theist presents and defends evidence for the arguments in favour of God, then they're not shifting the burden of proof, and hence the analogy isn't relevant. Unfortunately, some atheists believe that there can be no evidence for God whatsoever, and it is from this mistaken presupposition that a particular strategy involving a teapot floating in outer space has emerged. Okay, this is an utterly bizarre take. It's a giant red flag. Before explaining why, though, let's replay Nate's words so that they're fixed in our mind. Unfortunately, some atheists believe that there can be no evidence for God whatsoever, and it is from this mistaken presupposition that a particular strategy involving a teapot floating in outer space has emerged. So to even suggest that Russell came up with his teapot analogy based on the presupposition that there can be no evidence for God whatsoever is to fundamentally mistake him. In his article, Russell issued a response to several alleged pieces of evidence put forth by theists, and his setup for his analogy very clearly is in context of theists refusing to defend their claims with logic, reason, or evidence. What's more, suppose that Russell, or indeed any atheist, did presuppose that there can be no evidence for God's existence. Why, then, would he create, in Russell's case, or employ, in my case, for instance, an analogy that pertains to the evidential burden of proof in context of God's existence? The narrative that Nate is spinning here is not only false, but it's complete nonsense. So the argument goes, we cannot conclusively prove that there is not a teapot orbiting the sun somewhere in outer space, but given the lack of evidence for such a teapot, its likelihood is so low that the reasonable conclusion should be that it does not exist. No, that's not what Russell's teapot analogy expresses. The analogy doesn't draw any conclusion on the existence of the teapot and it certainly doesn't draw a probabilistic conclusion on the existence of the teapot. Further still, it definitely doesn't, as Nate claims, draw a probabilistic conclusion on the existence of the teapot based on a lack of evidence. And it definitely, most certainly, doesn't draw a probabilistic conclusion on the existence of the teapot based on a presupposition of there being no evidence for the teapot's existence, or by analogy, God's existence. Nate is impressively confused here. 
but it's for a reason which he'll reveal now. Likewise, we cannot conclusively prove that God does not exist, but given the lack of evidence for God, the reasonable conclusion should be that he does not exist. This particular argument originated with philosopher Bertrand Russell in a letter that he wrote in 1958. And here's part of that letter. I do not think the existence of the Christian God any more probable than the existence of the gods of Olympus or Valhalla. To take another illustration, nobody can prove that there is not between the Earth and Mars a China teapot revolving in an elliptical orbit, but nobody thinks this sufficiently likely to be taken into account in practice. I think the Christian God just as unlikely." And this reference explains, at least partially, why Nate is so confused. He's referenced a personal letter from 1958 rather than the unpublished article commissioned in 1952 by Illustrated Magazine. Indeed, it seems that Nate wasn't wrestling with Russell's teapot ten years ago, but rather a completely different analogy that Russell gave, fair enough, but one that has absolutely nothing to do with the burden of proof. Let's bring up the letter. Russell's words just before Nate chose to start the quote state, I ought to call myself an agnostic, but for all practical purposes I am an atheist. And to then illustrate just how unlikely he finds Christianity to be true, he gave an analogy using a celestial teapot. Hence, Russell was illustrating to Mr. Major and Mr. Lewis just how unlikely he considers Christianity to be. Note again that this has nothing to do with the burden of proof. Now, while Russell has used a celestial teapot as an analogy, this obviously isn't in the context of the burden of proof. I've used a unicorn as an analogy multiple times to give an example, but each analogy has served a different point. In his 1958 letter, Russell used a celestial teapot to illustrate how unlikely he finds Christianity to be true, whereas in his 1952 article he's used a celestial teapot to illustrate where the burden of proof lies. Hence, Nate isn't even referencing the source material that he's confidently claiming to rebut. Now this wasn't just Bertrand Russell that said this, a number of decades later, Richard Dawkins commented on Russell's idea in The God Delusion. This is what he said. Russell's point is that the burden of proof rests with the believers, not the non-believers. And now, somehow, things are getting even more off track. Dawkins's quote here is explicitly in reference to Russell's 1952 article, not the 1958 correspondence that Nate is convinced Russell's burden of proof analogy comes from. Again, the burden of proof is only relevant to the 1952 article, and any philosophical source will make that clear. There's no way to read the 1958 letter to get the impression that Russell was talking about the burden of proof. If Nate had read Dawkins' book, or even just a few words above where he took the quote, he'd have probably realised this. Mine is the related point that the odds in favour of the teapot, or spaghetti monster, or Esmeralda and Keith, unicorn, whatever, are not equal to the odds against. So there are a couple of problems that I just want to talk about in the rest of this video with elements in Russell's and Dawkins comments. All right. First, they both assume that there is no evidence for God. No, they don't. Let's start with Dawkins. In the chapter reference, Dawkins is talking about various levels of credence in theism. He doesn't at all presuppose that there's no evidence for God's existence. Nate is simply factually incorrect here. Likewise, Russell, in his 1952 article, doesn't presuppose that there's no evidence for God's existence. Russell drew his analogy in reference to a variation of theism, and then illustrated that the burden of proof doesn't rest upon the non-believer. So Nate is again simply factually incorrect here. And lastly, in his 1958 letter to Mr. Major and Mr. Lewis, which is completely irrelevant to the burden of proof analogy, but since Nate thinks it is, we'll deal with it nonetheless, Russell did not claim that there's no evidence for God's existence, either explicitly or implicitly. He merely gave an analogy to represent how unlikely he personally finds Christianity to be true. Nate is, on all accounts, simply mistaken. At least it seems that Russell's presupposition is that there is no evidence, thus allowing for his analogy. And Dawkins appears to accept Russell's analogy wholesale. Second, Dawkins claims through Russell that since there is no evidence for God, Theists are the only ones that bear the burden of proof. No, Dawkins' point has nothing to do with the burden of proof. His point was that in the absence of evidence, which is what he took the teapot analogy to establish, the natural assignment of probability to theism is not 50%, as the intuition of some might tell them. 
Dawkins took Russell's unfalsifiable teapot, and rather than making a statement about the burden of proof, he made a statement about the probability of unfalsifiable propositions. Now, like I said, I've talked about uh, the burden of proof and shouldering the burden of proof in a couple of previous videos that I highly encourage you go check out if you have not already watched those videos. And again, I'll tackle what Nate has to say if you want me to. Just let me know. But here's my problem with Russell's presupposition. When an atheist states that there is no evidence for a teapot floating in outer space, he likely means that there is no empirical evidence for it. In other words, to say that there is no evidence is to say that, as far as we know, no one has seen or touched a teapot floating in outer space. But to suggest that evidence for God is the same thing as empirical evidence for a teapot is to misunderstand the evidence for God typically appealed to by theists. No, it's to misunderstand what Russell was conveying. Russell's point is that if someone makes a claim, say that reincarnation is a thing, then the person making the claim has the burden to prove it, be it through a posteriori or a priori means. If instead they insist that others disprove their claim, then they'd be guilty of shifting the burden of proof. And this is true whatever the evidential state of the proposition, it doesn't matter how much evidence is in its favour. If the teapot could be easily disproved, then this is what some interlocutors would do, they just disprove it. But Russell's whole point is that it's not their burden to do, thus him specifying that the teapot is unfalsifiable. This removes the option of attempting to disprove it, and in doing so makes the burden of proof the only thing on stage. Put another way, the unfalsifiable component is clothing. The actual body is the shifting of the burden of proof. Related to this issue, Dr. Brian Garvey writes this, God is invoked as an explanation for why the universe exists at all, why it is intelligible, why it is governed by laws, why it is governed by the laws it is rather than some other laws, and doubtless many other things. So therefore, the evidences for God are the universe. It is the intelligibility of the universe, its physical laws, etc. Right, so in this case, Nate has asserted that there's evidence for God's existence. He's making a positive claim. And so he has the burden of explaining why, for instance, an insanely vast universe that's broadly incredibly hostile to life is expected on theism. And when he gives his reasons and arguments, we can have a discussion. But if, instead of defending his claim, he insists that I disprove it, then he'd be shifting the burden of proof, just as Russell was illustrating. It's not up to me to prove that the physical laws are not expected under theism, not in this context. And it doesn't matter if Nate's claim is a fact or an explanation, Russell's point stands. The burden is his to fulfil. That God is a proposed explanation doesn't excuse it from Russell's point. Reincarnation is a proposed explanation of evil, and not just human evil. But if I claim that reincarnation is true, I inherit the burden of proof. In this case, Nate wouldn't get a burden to prove that it's not true. So Russell's analogy fails in large part because it likens two different sets of evidences. Evidences for some kind of floating object out in space, and evidences that are effects of an explanation. Now, this is a really weird division of evidence from Nate. He claims that one type of evidence is some kind of floating object in space, and the other is effects of an explanation. But this can be quickly disposed of by simply noting that the effect that is our orbit is explained by the floating object that is the sun. But more to the point, whether one claims a mere fact or an entire explanation of a multitude of different phenomena, they inherit a burden of proof. Russell's teapot is not an explanation for anything. It simply exists as a rhetorical device. Or, as Nate said earlier, it's a thought experiment, an analogy to illustrate the locus of the burden of proof. God, on the other hand, is an explanation for a number of things. Now I'll get to why this matters with the burden of proof, so stick with me on this. But with regard to the universe itself, consider the Kalam cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe had a cause. Or even, check this out, this is a form of the teleological argument appealing to the fine-tuning of the universe. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. It is not due to physical necessity or chance, therefore it is due to design. In both arguments, here's what I want you to see. In both arguments, a causal agent, namely God, is inferred as being the explanation for the universe, as well as its features. Goodness me, does Nate's confident confusion have no bounds? He claims that the two arguments he's just given would get us to God. 
In both arguments, here's what I want you to see. In both arguments, a causal agent, namely God, is inferred as being the explanation for the universe, as well as its features. But neither of these arguments, if sound, would get us to God. The Kalam would merely establish that there's at least one uncaused cause, and that's it. And the teleological argument that Nate gave wouldn't get us to a single designer, nor a designer that still exists, nor one that's omnipotent, and certainly not one that communicates through angels, as the three Abrahamic religions insist. This does not mean that God is like a physical object floating in space like a teacup. It just means that God is an inference to the best explanation. Considering God as an explanation for the universe, as well as considering like the universe as evidence for God, Dawkins' comment on the burden of proof needs to be reevaluated, in my opinion. Well, in my opinion, Nate should reevaluate his take on Russell's teapot and Dawkins' additional point, because it's almost as if he hasn't read either. Whether or not Russell's floating teacup actually exists is irrelevant to the universe. Like I said, his teacup is not an explanation for anything. And Russell never claimed it to be. I think, uh, I think I'm about done with this. So one's worldview of the universe is not devoid of explanation if Russell's teacup does not exist. However, if God does not exist, there must be another explanation for the universe and its particular features. No, this also isn't true. Just as theists claim that there's no explanation for the most basic facts, so can atheists. In fact, everyone's worldview is going to come down to at least one fact that has no justification, it's got no explanation. Theists that assume God to be a brute fact will tell you that there's no explanation for why God exists, he just does. And theists that assume that God is a necessary being will tell you that there's no explanation for why necessary beings exist, they just do, even if it's a singleton set. An atheist, if they're so inclined, could say that there's no explanation for why the universe exists, and in doing so they'd be committing themselves to way lighter ontological baggage than theists do. Also, atheists could just say the words that theists despise. They could say, I don't know. Nate is assuming that just because he's committed himself to a proposed explanation that all non-Christians are equally committed. They're not. And see, now I'm getting to the heart of the issue. It's right here. In contrast to the Christian who proposes the Christian God as the explanation for the universe and its properties, atheists and skeptics who challenge Christians are doing so from the position that something other than the Christian God is the explanation. But are they? It depends, of course, on the scenario. If Nate claims that God is an excellent explanation of, say, the parasitic reproductive system of wasps, evolution by natural selection, and the great many mass extinctions of the past, which is to say features of the universe, then I'm going to ask him to defend his assertion. Notice here that I haven't committed myself to an alternative explanation of the universe, hence I don't have a burden like Nate. I'm not claiming to have an explanation. And they do that because they attempt to disprove Christian arguments and conversations and debates, and because they conduct their lives in a manner as if the Christian God does not exist. That's their position on this issue. So the idea that atheism is... It's a passive enterprise. You know, there, there, there is no claim. We're not, we're not making any positive claims here. That's misleading. This is a position that trades on the proposition that reality is explained by other than, okay? Something other than the Christian God. Well, I'm only going to be repeating myself at this point. If Nate's debate partner doesn't claim to have an explanation for a given phenomena, then they obviously don't have a burden of proof. And when it comes to such things as why the universe exists, it's perfectly respectful to say, I don't know, which again doesn't come with a burden of proof. So really at base, both theists and atheists are looking at the same evidence, right? The universe and its features, and drawing two different conclusions. This is why I've said before, both theists and atheists should take turns shouldering their own burden of proof. And see, that's not the only problem with this kind of issue. There's another problem. And this other problem is the way that some folks view science. And now I want to zoom in on something called methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism is irrelevant to Russell's teapot, and so we call it here. But just as I'm happy to respond to Nate's other claims pertaining to the burden of proof, I'm also happy to comment on what he has to say about methodological naturalism. Just let me know if you want to see it. Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and YouTube members.